turn out to welcome uh, Steve Miller to our community and first I would like to um, invite Mayor Will Flanagan to come down and for his greetings and I just want to take a moment uh, to thank Julianne Kelly uh, for all that she's doing uh, to make really the city of Fall River a healthier community and also working with Mass in Motion, uh, working with the Fall River Bike Committee. It's, we have some really great initiatives going on here in the city. And the presentation you're going to have today by Steve Miller really focuses in on what communities can do uh, to improve their image, uh, lead a healthier lifestyle, and really improve the quality of life within their community and it all focuses on transportation. Whether we're using public transportation, uh, commuter rail, a bus, whether we're using bicycles to get to and from where we need to go, or whether we're just walking a city street, uh, transportation gets us to where we want to go and is a modal for getting us to where we need to be. And Fall River has really taken on some great initiatives uh, in the last four years to improve uh, our livable streets. We've been working with SRTA, and I see a representative from here, from the, from there this here this evening. And we've been expanding public bus service within the community, uh, night and weekend service, making it more ac accessible uh, for people to use public transportation working with Mass in Motion, working with our planning department, working with the bicycle committee. We've been expanding uh, bicycle paths within the community. One of the great projects we've undertaken and we'll see the completion is the Crookersham River Rail Trail, taking miles of trail along the pristine Crookersham River as an access point uh, for exercise and as an access point for really just a quality of life Focal point within our city. So I just wanted to have this turnout on, on a Thursday evening, on a chilly, cold, freezing um, <laughs> last day of February night. Uh, shows the commitment that our community has. And uh, hearing about Steve and, and reading up on his bio, you're bringing somebody into the city who gets it, uh, who gets it, and talks about it, and then helps communities implement it. So it's great to have that level of expertise here. I really have to uh, take my hat off to Julianne Kelly uh, for uh, spearheading and working with everybody here and keeping us all together. Julie, again, thank you, and also want to welcome Steve here. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. The Mayor just said all the high highlights and the important things, so <laughs> really, <laughs> that, yeah, it's really. <laughs> All right, let me just give you a little background on Steve Miller. Steve Miller is Executive Director of the Healthy Weight Initiative of the Harvard School of Public Health and a founding board member of Livable Streets Alliance, a transportation advocacy group. He started Boston's Hub on Wheels Bicycle Festival and continues to advise the Boston Bike Program. He's a gubernatorial pedestrian advocate appointee on the state's Bicycle and Pedestrian advocacy, ad, Advisory Board. Miller has previously been very engaged in education policy, particularly using technology as a tool for education reform. He was an invited presenter at President Clinton's Education Summit and became the first board chair of Tech Boston Academy, an inner city public pilot school whose innovation and achievement was recognized by a visit from President Barack Obama. He has published four books on public policy. He currently publishes a blog entitled The Public Way, Transportation, Health, and Livable Communities. And Steve, I just want to say we have really a diverse group here representing neighborhoods, representing different committees, um, bicycle, pedestrian, 
livable streets and uh, people from University of Massachusetts, Bristol Community College. So uh, welcome and thank you. We're thank so you very much. Happy to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, it's true, the mayor did hit many of the, the key points. Transportation is one of these incredibly high leverage things. It changes everything. And I'll go into some of that in a little bit. But it's also, it's not just about bicycles or walking or buses. It's also about cars. I drove my car here. I love my car. It's not about hating cars or hating buses. It's about figuring out how do you use all these tools to create the kind of communities and the kind of life that you want to live. So transportation affects almost everything about our lives, if you think about it. Okay? It affects the way our houses are laid out, where we live, where we can work, given where we live, where we shop. It affects who we see in our spare time and what we do for fun. It shapes everything. And it doesn't matter which mode. Cities were originally built up around rivers. Now we build our suburbs around the, the, the trucks and the, uh, the highways. But it all works so that transportation is like the Siamese twin of the other most powerful thing shaping our lives in the built environment is land use. Where you run a highway, you get development. Where you get development, you get transportation. They're joined at the hip. And the good news about that is it means as you change one of them, whether it be zoning or transportation, you change the other. It gives you a lot of leverage, which is partly why I'm now involved in transportation. It's not that I, I do love my car, but I'm not a mechanic. I don't spend my t life thinking about transportation. Actually, my goal is a livable community. And I think livable streets are the road you get to a livable community. So the trouble with transportation is it doesn't really work well for a lot of us many of the times. It's annoying. We get congestion. We get smell. We get noise. And the other problem is we all think it's the other guy's fault. The fact is, we all use the roads. We all have to go back and forth. So we've got to figure out, how do we do this differently? And the real question is, what do we want to accomplish? So the starting point is, you need to know where you want to end up, or else you never know if you're off track. Right? It's one of my favorite street signs. <laughs> Right down the street from my house. No, it's at the BU Bridge. Sorry. So here we are at Fall River, which I've now learned has a whole other forest to side on the other side of one of these waters. Incredible. What a resource. Of course, you can't get there, right? You can get there. How, how do we start by figuring out what's our goal? How do we know how do we get, move towards there? So some communities around the country, around the world, have done a variety of processes. Somerville, where I used to live, has done something called Summer Vision. This is a three-year program of having small community meetings around the city, having outside experts come in, give talks about city planning, transportation, architecture, and coming up with a vision of what do they want. And it's not just Somerville. This is going on all over the world. But what's amazing? is almost everybody, for all our diversity, come up with similar themes. A lot of words here, but think of any of these get home to you. Walkable, varied, busy but not overcrowded, lots of retail space, restaurants, little stores you can walk to, bicycle, transit accessible, lots of opportunity to meet and socialize with others, dense but not high rise, energy efficient, green, Clean air, trees, cultural activities, arts, music, but quiet spaces, parks, things you can hide and be by yourself, things you can play with, and places to work. Sounds pretty ordinary, but it turns out that's what we want. Why is it so difficult to get there? In fact, it's too many words, so we started trying to boil it down. So one of the things 
came up with this concept, livable streets. And here are some of the key words we thought begin to boil down some of that. We want an efficient transportation system. Gets you from here to there. Not too long. We want it safe. We want it multimodal. It's not just about cars. We spent 50 years basically putting all our eggs in that one car basket, and it's got a flat tire at this point. We cannot, we've learned, get rid of congestion and pollution by building more roads. We cannot speed up your commute by building more interchanges. We need to think out of that box. Healthy should be given a, a no-brainer. Green. You know, if the sea rises it too much, uh, Fall River's in trouble here. Smart. There's a lot of technology out there that we can use. Accessible. No one should be kept out because you can't walk or jump. And it should be fun. Right? So part of the way all this gets, translates, gets translated is something called complete streets. The, the idea of complete streets is it says a street that's only designed for cars or only designed for bikes, or only designed for buses, is an incomplete street. If you're talking transportation, you want a complete system. You want a street that's capable of handling every way that a user wants to go. A complete street is able to handle someone with a wheelchair, someone on a bike, who is not a crazy bicyclist like myself, but it was like my daughter, who was very nervous about getting in traffic. That's a complete street. And here's the amazing thing, and I'll come back to this over and over. It turns out that complete streets are safer streets, not just for the pedestrians, not just for the bicyclists, not just for the old people with the walkers and the young people running to school not looking, and the mothers and fathers pushing the baby carriages. Complete streets are actually safer for car drivers. And we'll talk about that, why that is so important and so true. It also turns out that complete streets are one of the most practical economic development strategies you can come up to. We were talking this afternoon uh, with Perry? Perry. What's his last name? Long. Perry Long. About the fact, the way you develop a community has as much to do with improving the quality of life of its residents as it does with attracting new businesses. I used to do industrial consulting, and there's a whole thing called total quality management. Some of you may have heard of it. And one of its insights is you're running a business because you're supposed to make money. If you put money as your number one, two, and three priority, you're going to fall apart in terms of productivity, fall apart in per terms of quality, and end up not making money. But if you actually say, we're going to do the best product, best service possible, we're going to have the best workplace possible. Not only does your quality go up, but you actually do end up making more money. Same is true in cities. If all we say is important is more jobs, getting more businesses, we will fail at that, and we'll have a lousy community besides. If we say our goal is building a healthy, livable community, using our streets as part of the process, you will end up being prosperous. Doesn't sound like a total connection, but it works. But I'm going to go from complete streets, which is about pavement design. Let's talk about the people, because it's the emotions, it's the people, it's the feeling that really counts. Enrique uh, Peñalosa, who was the mayor of Bogota, Colombia, he was not a drug runner, used to say, the goal of urban life is happiness. Happiness. And he said, the goal of our transportation system is to contribute to those happiness. And here's what he said. We need what makes us happy? We need to walk, just as birds need to fly. I know I feel a lot happier when I'm out moving around, and I get pretty irritable when I'm sitting still for too long. I bet you feel somewhat the same way. I know my kids do. We need to be around other people. Yeah. We need beauty. We need contact with nature. And most of all, we need not to be, not to, we need not to not I got a wording in there. We don't want to be ex excluded. We need to feel some sort of equity, of equality. Every one of us wants to feel that we are important, we are treated with dignity, and we have these other characteristics, and that's what makes happiness. So let's look at it. Transportation and happiness. Let's call it down. Safe and healthy. 
walkable, bikeable, sociable, beautiful, sustainable, nature enhancing, inclusive, accessible, equitable, affordable, efficient, and commerce enhancing. And you now have the outline of what we're going to talk about. So let's start with safe and healthy. First thing about transportation and safety is speed kills. If you get hit by a car going 40 miles an hour, there's an 80% chance that you're dead. Not injured, dead. If you cut the speed in half, you cut the percentage of death almost down to the bottom, to 5%. These are not parallel lines. Danger drops even faster than speed. So for every mile per hour you slow traffic down, the percentage of people who survive a collision doubles or triples, depending on how you play that curve. This is the most important thing about safety and transportation. Okay? Slow it down. Now the good news is not only does it mean the pedestrian or the bicyclist lives, it turns out when you drive slower you have fewer accidents. And Drivers live, or at least their cars do, right? And your insurance rate goes down. Oops, wrong one. There it is. So, how do you slow things down? There's a whole art to it and a science. And the terms are traffic calming and road diets. Now, road diets have two types. There's one where you just squeeze the entire road, right? Maybe instead of having four lanes of traffic, you have three. Instead of having three, you have two. And you use that remaining space for sidewalks, or for bike facilities, or for crosswalks, or for playgrounds, or for outdoor seating at a cafe. A whole lot of stuff you can do when you diet the road. But there's also lane diets, where you take a road lane, it's typically 12 to 15 feet wide, and you turn it down to 11 or 11.5, or 10 even. The research is pretty clear that narrower traffic lanes are at least as safe, and some research says safer, than the larger lanes. Why? Cars slow down. Pretty much that simple. Cars slow down, and the driver pays more attention. The reason highways are wonderful highways for fast driving across the country is the lanes are wide, the curves are slow, there's no distractions, you can't even have trees near them. The billboards are back, right? There's no sidewalks, there's no stores. We were mentioning this before. How many of you, like myself, have gone on long highway trips and after about two or three hours driving you arrive and you think, I have no idea where I just was? <laughs> it's called, there's a whole term for it, it's called highway amnesia. You can mindlessly function really well on a highway, right? That is not a good strategy for driving down a city street where there are people, where there are activities, where the roads are narrower and the corners are tighter, okay? We've been stuck with a whole lot of migration of highway design ideas where they are appropriate to city streets where they're not appropriate. And that's part of our strategic opportunity in the world of transportation. Traffic calming. We want sharper corners. You don't want a soft turn. When you come to an intersection, I saw several as we were driving around today, you don't want to be able to have that nice soft curve where you don't have to stop at all, right? How's the pedestrian supposed to get by there? What you want is to come to a T or a, a cross, and there's a light. So you stop at the light, you look, there's no pedestrians. Or there is a pedestrian, but you're able to see them, and you slow down. That's not a decision the driver makes. That's dictated by the shape of the road. Another key point that all this depends on. I myself, I have to confess, drive, not necessarily according to the official speed limit, but according to the structural limit. How fast does this road feel comfortable driving? I'm willing to bet most of you do too. The speed limit may be 25, but it's five lanes wide and there's nobody there. I'm going 50 miles an hour. 
I'm sorry, but it's true. If there's potholes and sharp turns and lots of things going on and I'm worried there's a playground and some kid's going to, I'm going 15 miles an hour. The road tells me what the right speed is. Now, I'm not making this up. This is basic traffic engineering, right? So then why do we build roads that make it feel comfortable to go 50 miles an hour in the city? Bad news. Yeah? So the fire trucks can go faster. That's an excellent point. And they've done a lot of studies because you do not want to build a city where you couldn't get to a fire. It turns out there's ways to build corners, such as bulb outs, another traffic calming process. And I'll show you some pictures. Actually, can I come to that later? Because sure. our, the pictures yeah, no, make it easier. Devil, no, but it's a good question and an important one. You don't want your city to burn down. It turns out it's a false problem. And we'll get to that. Curves, bump outs, bulb outs. We'll get to most, most of these things. OK. Does it work? Well, the answer is yes. This is right near my house in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Central Square on the left. This is what it was when I first moved to town. And I want you to count them. The number of lanes going across, we've got the taxis on the left. That's one, then two, then three, then the center line. Four, five, go next. Six, and then there's a parking lane. Seven, seven lanes. This intersection here took, oh, and here's your free right turn, right, over there. You didn't even have to slow down. And that was a, that was a bit of a turn, but people didn't slow down anyway. This whole intersection handled about 10,000 cars per day, 10,000 cars per day, right, average vehicle transportation. Okay, traffic calming. Take a look at this. We now have one through lane in each direction, one. We have bike lanes on both sides, separate bus pullovers, and there's a turning lane up on the, the top corner. It looks like a, on the outside of the bike lane, it's actually a turning lane, okay? We have radically changed, we got rid of the, uh, the cut through here, it's now a whole pedestrian plaza, right? Huge zebras, watch this one, I'm gonna keep coming back to them. This is, this is a crosswalk. You know those two skinny lines that go up? That's not a crosswalk, that's an empty pipe waiting for a car to fill it. This is a crosswalk, that's a zebra stripe, okay? So, 10,000 a day, see how much road space was taken away? How many do you think how many cars a day do you think that handles? 10,000. Exactly the same. In fact, originally it handled more, and they had to mess up the traffic lights to keep the cars from going too fast, deliberately. Okay? Because it turns out the real issue is less the structure or the number of lanes, because over here, all you were doing is rushing to the next red light. If you adjust the timing of the red lights, you actually get traffic through just as fast with less space. It's more about the signals than it is about the number of lanes. We'll come back to that. Here are some other traffic calming devices. A top left is called a chicane, like a jig, uh, zigzag, right? Not too hard to ride your bike through there. Try it at 50 miles an hour in a car. Elevated intersection up on the top right. Combination of a bulb out, you see the sidewalk comes out. It means that people have less distance they have to travel to cross the road. So you can do it a little quicker, a little safer. And it's an elevated, it's sort of, um, as the car comes, it's like a long speed bump. It does two things. One, it forces the cars to slow down. And second, it tells every driver you are entering pedestrian space. Be careful. Not that instead of telling the pedestrian, you are entering car space, watch out, it reverses it. The priority here is the pedestrian. The car is the visitor in that space. OK? Bottom right, the visual narrowness. This is a street. It was not narrowed at all, except they put up these planters visually for a driver, it feels narrower, and people slow down. Here's another little device. Um, you actually push the stop, so, uh, stop line 20, 30, 40 feet away from the corner. It improves visibility and gives people more time to get across before the cars come. A bunch of quick, easy things. So we're supposed to be healthy. I said safety. This is health. 
You're supposed to do some exercise every day. We're all supposed to be healthy. If you want to lose weight, you've got to do 60 minutes a day. If you want, actually, if you want to keep your weight off at 60 minutes a day, if you want to lose weight, you've got to change your food. I work at the Harvard School of Public Health. It's just it's the basic science. I'm afraid it's the way it is. You've got to eat less, work more. Sorry. But the hard part is how do you do this on a daily basis? If you've got to go to the gym, that's extra money. And if you've got kids at home and extra work, you don't have time. This is why streets and transportation are so powerful for public health. Because if you make a town bikeable and walkable, that's how I go shopping. I've suddenly got my day's worth of exercise. If I make it bikeable, that's how I get to work. Now in Boston, I'll tell you, I have never yet found that it was, took longer to go by bike than by car. I have gone across half the city racing somebody in a car, and I beat them in my bike. Why? Because it's all the traffic lights. It's all the congestion. It's all the cars. Lack of physical activity. You just don't want to go down this. It's, it's terrible. You're depressed. You feel bad. Your clothes don't fit. You know, it's, it's, your kids make fun of you. It's really bad. One of the amazing things about bicycling is that it's almost inherently healthy. So if you really want to walk up to the level of vigorous exercise, which is what you need, moderate to vigorous exercise, 20 minutes a day, you've got to walk fast. Do you ever see those pictures of Mike Dukakis with his power walk when he was running for me? This was how he exercised, power walking. Looks a little weird. Nice guy. Bicycling, all you've got to do is go at a normal pace, and you're automatically getting the right level of exercise. Phenomenal studies done in Amsterdam where they've got hundreds of thousands of people doing this. For every year of life, because bike, biking can be dangerous, right? So statistically, you add it up. For every year of life lost to a bike crash, 20 years of life are gained from stress reduction, cardiovascular fitness, improved mental health. Unbelievable. I mean, that's better than playing the lottery, you know? Those are good odds. So, the other piece I like is over a 10-year study span, non-bikers, this is like a reverse psychology line here, even people physically active in sports died more frequently than people who did moderate levels of bicycling. Bicycling is incredibly <coughs> healthy. Air pollution, I won't go over all this, but you've got a lot of highways here, there's a lot of air pollution, asthma, there's a whole new science about um, the effect of very minute particles on our health deep in our lungs. So transportation and happiness. Next topic. Walkable, bikeable, sociable. I'm going to get into this. I'm going to actually come around to this one twice. This is what our streets are really like. Right? The advantage is you've got some people talk to, talking together, and the disadvantage is they can't get across the street. Why did the little old lady cross the street? Right? Because her friends were on the other side. Right? This is how our streets feel for many people. They're scary. And what I like about this picture is it's not even that there's cars there. You're scared because the car might come. You see that little corner up there? There's a car maybe coming. People are scared of our streets. It keeps them in their houses. It makes them isolated. And in fact, a guy named Donald Appleyard, who wrote a book called Livable Streets, whose title we, told, we stole, has done a whole study. This is amazing. If you live on a city, in a street, with light traffic, on average, you have three plus friends who live on the street. As the traffic goes up, the number of friends you have on your street, your block, goes down. Cars, friends, what's the connection? The connection is you don't go outside as often. You don't hang out outside. You don't walk to the <laughs> local store. You don't meet people. Who wants to stand outside with noise, smell, and danger? And you sure don't let your kids go out. If your kids are out, aren't out, you're not meeting their parents, the other kid's parent. You know, that's how it works. Dogs and little kids, you meet the neighbors, right? You don't go out when there's a lot of traffic. This is an incredibly important fact. This doesn't happen if the street is scary. Or if this happens. So here are some things to think about for pedestrians. First, we talked about the zebras, wide. Right, okay, right up in the corner. Now, you may notice there's no sidewalk on the other side of the street, but okay, they got it part of the way. 
There is these signs, you see them many places. Do you have them here? State law yield to pedestrians. So for a while, in a couple of the suburbs in Boston, some of the teenagers were figuring out ways to hit these late at night. That's gotten over. There's people have gotten used to it. It makes a difference. There's a lot of intersections now in Cambridge where these have been up for 10 years. A pedestrian steps off the curb and traffic stops. It's not because people there are better people than any place else. They're just used to it. They got used to it. That's what works. And the countdowns, really a big deal. If you know how much time you have left in your walk signal, you feel a lot more secure than if it starts blinking, and is it about to go, and am I going to get killed, right? It's really useful. Coupled with that is what's called LPI, Leading Pedestrian Indicator. It gives the pedestrian, before the traffic light for the cars go green, it gives you three to five seconds to start walking. Why is that important? Because once you're in the, off the curb and in the intersection, a car turning right is going to see you. Right? If you start at the same time the car is starting, you're on their blind side. There's a much higher chance they're going to scrape into you as they go by. Leading pedestrian indicators and countdowns. This is uh, Harvard Square. Okay, they've turned the entire major intersection, right where everybody meets, into a raised platform. They spend more time per cycle for pedestrians to cross than for cars. If you want to go fast, go someplace else. Here's some other way, interesting ways to help pedestrians. So this is a shared street. There's a whole philosophy about saying no curves, no signs. Everybody is allowed to drive, bike. You can put a push cart there and start selling anything. It's an open your street, but everybody is responsible for any damage they do. So you want to drive your truck down there? You're welcome. Three miles an hour is probably the smartest thing to do. You want to ride your bike? Watch out for pedestrians. It works. It works. Those kinds of streets work. We talked about raised. This is a raised crosswalk with a bulb out. Up there is an even bigger bulb out, and you can see how and this, this is where we get into the, the fire trucks. Now, they didn't, they did something a little funny there. They have a tree right at the end of it. Not a good idea. What you want to do is have, for example, a bulb out, bulb out where if a fire truck has to go around, it can drive right over that sidewalk. That bulb out is mountable. So you may have, if you've ever been out west, they have what are called mountable curves. Instead of our curves that are like rectangular, they have curved tops, especially at corners. It allows emergency vehicles to make the turn and to get by. And this embodies an incredibly important principle. Design a road or a sidewalk for the majority of situations, but keep it flexible to handle the special cases. Having a fire truck go through that intersection is a special case. It does not happen every day, every minute. So design it for what it's mostly used for, which is pedestrians. But make it available so that it's possible for the fire truck to get through. What we tend to do is we say, what does the fire truck need, or the emergency vehicles, or, or whatever it is? Build it for them, and then everybody else has to fit themselves in with no flexibility. Not good. Some other thing. Oh, I meant, am I going backwards here? OK. The other good thing about walkability is you can't walk that far. So you really do need to complement walkability with good transit system. Without a good bus system, walking is not a sufficient solution. Now, bicycles are much better. You can get across the city on a bike. But not all of us want a bike in every weather. So you really need to think about transit as part of your walking and part of your walkability. Another way to look at it is every bus ride starts and ends with a walk. Every walk, well, not every walk starts and ends with a buck, but very important in the middle. OK. <laughs> One of the key things here is to think about is placemaking. What we want to do is not merely have pipes for vehicles and people to go through. We want being there to be part of what the street is about. Streets are the largest single physical asset owned by almost any city in America, maybe in the world. What we do now is we basically take our largest single asset and we give it almost for free for one purpose, mostly parking. 
but some driving, right? Actually, we use more space for parking than we do for driving. Why not use that space for other things as well? It's ours, public space. Cars don't own it, we own it. It's public space. So, turn it into placemaking. And this bottom picture I love, because you've got the car, the bike, you've got the tables sitting out on it. This is a functional street. This is a street that people use for transportation, but it's a living street. Now, you don't want to do this with uh, Route 79 out here, but I bet you there's a lot of streets where you could do something like that. Hey, this is New York City, Broadway. It's the center of the world, right? Those pedestrians are braver than others. And this is what they have now. Same intersection. Look at this. If New York City can do this on Broadway, they turned it into a plaza. I just was reading an article by uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan, who was a traffic commissioner there. She said, when we first set this up, we were scared out of our minds. We figured no one was going to do it. We, we, we'll try it. We'll see what happens. And to protect themselves, they did a really smart thing that you can do here, which is they did it on a cheap, temporary basis. They didn't pour any concrete. They didn't paint anything. They put up planters and signs. Right? Planters and signs and a lot of chairs and tables. Instantly, within half an hour, people were sitting there. Two months later, they came back and made it permanent because they'd already proved their point. If it didn't work, well, planters and signs, big deal, cheap. As much as you can experiment, the better. Here we are, Times Square. I mean, think about how many of these people are buying at the local stores versus how many people are buying at the local stores here. Again, economic development, making a place out of our transportation system. You can do it on little street corners. This is a group in California. They uh, were really sick of the way cars were zipping through their neighborhood. So one day, they actually went out and painted this on the intersection. Now, phenomenal impact, because all of a sudden, cars get nervous. Drivers, what's going on? They slow down. But it also sends a message. This is our neighborhood space you're in, not a highway. Now, the city great part of the story is the city freaked out and said, you can't do that. They came and they scrubbed all the paint off. And there was such an uproar because people started saying, why? And they said, well, it blocks the cars. Yeah. It slows them down. Yeah. And they won. I was talking with some people on the bike commission earlier. You need to think about what you want and be very assertive about pushing for it. Not obnoxious, just assertive. Because you can win. It's doable. This is from Parking Day. So once a year now, started with a bunch of artists in California. All across the country, people arrange with City Hall, and you take over a parking spot. And you say, this may be a parking spot for cars normally, but today, it's a park. Roll out the grass, bring out the chairs, have a little picnic, spend the day. If you've got to put money in the meter all day, so what? <laughs> right? The point is to show a little guerrilla action. Streets are public places. There's nothing in the Constitution that I can find that guarantees they're purposing only for cars. Now, here's another little gimmick. We're going to get some more snow, right? Snow is a researcher's friend because now you're going to know how much of your street is not even now being used by cars. How do you know? Look at all the snow that's there. After a snowstorm, go up and down your streets. Three days later, how many cars still have snow on the top? How many cars have never been dug out? How many of our cars are extra cars we don't even really need to have parked in front of our house? We can put them in a garage down the block and do just as well and open up the street for bike lanes and pedestrians. Right? Here you have a natural scientific experiment. That is not a heavily used part of the street. What if you bowled out the intersection? Here, same thing. My favorite is up, where is it? Up there where I think you could actually have a whole plaza in the middle of an intersection. So, back to this. Walkable, bikeable, sociable. There's many kinds of types of cyclists. About 1% are what's called strong and fearless. OK? 
Okay, I sometimes bridge on that. My wife says stupid, but that's okay. Strong and fearless. There's about 7% enthusiastic and confident. That's mostly what I think of myself as. I'm enthusiastic. I'm pretty confident. I'm not afraid of too many things. I'm willing to get out there and, I don't know, try something that other people wouldn't. There's 32% of people, my cousin, for example, who will never get on a bike and think I'm crazy to even own one. Right? Forget them. Who cares? The key thing is there's 60% of the people who, if conditions are right, will get on a bike. Now, the Federal Highway Department has done studies, and they say that in congested areas, the drop of 10% of the number of cars on the road would entirely open up the road. Not 50%, not 30%, 10% of the cars is that margin that makes the difference. I think it's doable. If you can get two-thirds of that 60% to take bikes, some of the time, not every day, they did it once a week. Think how many cars are not on the road. So here's a couple of things you can do for bikes. I call this a standard bike lane or a naked bike lane. You have parking on one side, you have the bike lanes here, or this is how my friends prefer it. It's a joke. Come on, come on. Get it? Okay. Jeez. I gotta get rid of this one. Okay. You can have a buffered bike lane. Standard bike lane, preferably against a, a curb, no parking, and then a little bit of stripes along the side to move the cars out. You can take that through an intersection, green paint. There's a whole national program called Green Lanes. They got some money, you should apply for it. It helps you paint your green lanes through your city. Here, top left, it's a one-way for cars, two-way for bikes street. Call it a neighborhood greenway. It's a slow, low traffic street. The neighbors love it. Makes it safer for their kids to play outside. And it allows bikes, bikes to cut through preferential treatment. On the other hand, bikes are not going 40 miles an hour and running over people. On the right-hand side, it's a bike box. It is always safer for the bicycle to get out into that intersection, just like we talked about pedestrians getting out. Get the bike up front as the light turns, or allow them to go with the pedestrians on that leading indicator. But if you don't have that, get them out front, use the bike box to pull them up to the front, and get them in front of the cars. On the bottom left, it's a contra lane. This is a situation where you have a one-way street in one way. Bikes going with the traffic are in the lane, sharing the lane, but you have a specially marked corner where bikes can go in the other direction. Horrors. It seems so unsafe. It's not because the bike and the car driver, who are all going slow, I wouldn't do this on a highway, but they're relatively slow, they see each other. It's about as safe as you can get. No one's sneaking up behind, no one's curving around in front. And then the bottom right is a really good picture of something. Okay. <laughs> Another idea is slow it down, but also separate. That's what the whole point of bike lanes, separate it. What I like about this version of separation is not only do you have parked cars, but you also have a swale to be able to handle stormwater runoff between the bicycles and the sidewalk and the street. This is as beautiful a design as you could get. You don't always have that much space, but it's really nice. New York City. This is called cycle tracks. So on the bottom, on the left, there's a one-way bicycle uh, cycle track, a buffered spot, where you see it's pretty wide, and those are plastic bollards in here. They can be removed in the winter for snow plowing, but again, that's the exception. You leave them on during the summer most of the time. You add a little tree up here, I love nature, and then the parked cars, and then after that comes the moving cars. That is an utterly safe bike path. That is as good as going through the woods. Okay? On the right side is a two-way bike path, which has a little median strip in it. So what they did is they took over a side road, it was a lane, took it, cars off, turned it into a two-way bike road, free everybody up from the other side. This is a, a uh, cheap man's version. This is a bridge in Portland. They put uh, Jersey barriers up. Amazing thing, life did not end, traffic did not back up, and suddenly the number of cyclists tripled and none of them were on the sidewalk bothering the pedestrians. 
This is Vassar Street in Cambridge, right outside of MIT. A sidewalk level cycle track. You have two different styles of pavement. Sometimes there's overlap. Some of the uh, students who have just arrived at MIT don't quite know how to handle this. So every September there's a bit of a problem. But by April, it works pretty smoothly. I know I go up and down on this one every day. This is called bicycling and walking. In fact, if you look closely, it's fast and slow. So a little kid on a bicycle goes on the slow side. Somebody on roller skates goes on the fast side. But talk about separation. This is even better. And here's the good news. There's safety in numbers. I love this graph. The dark lines are the increasing number of miles in New York City of bike facilities. The line rising is the number of bicyclists in New York. You see it rises even faster than the amount of rise of facilities. And here's the amazing line, the one that goes down. That's the rate of bicycle accidents. The more people riding bikes or walking, the safer it is for every one of them. Why? It's very simple. Drivers get more used to that. The more it's considered part of the normal street life, the more drivers are looking for you. The most dangerous time, I hate to say it, is when you're just starting and they have no idea that you're supposed to be there. But you've got to pass through that. And that's what happened. Every city that's done this research, Portland, Boston, Cambridge, New York, Australia, London, Paris, same curves. Same curves. If you build it, they come in greater numbers than you've built it, and the rate of accidents goes down. Another way of looking at it. In the United States, we have low percentage of bicycling and walking, a high percentage of fatalities. In the Netherlands, we have a huge percentage of bicycling and walking and a very low percentage of fatalities. If you build it, they come. This is an amazing curve. Number of collisions in Boston. You all know Boston's been going nuts with bicycling. Look at the number of collisions, of bicycle collisions. It has not gone up as the numbers of bicyclists have shot up through. This is partly why that's happened. Boston's in the process of building a citywide bicycle network. I was talking earlier with some people about the need to create what we are calling a conceptual vision plan of how you would cover this city. Not every road, not every street, but the main thrust of what a bicycly connected, bike-friendly community would look like. And then you can go off and build it. So this is their vision of where they're going to go. One last point. Rail trails. You've got a fabulous opportunity here with the South Coast Trail, or PATH. What's the official title? Bikeway. Bikeway, thank South you. Coast bikeway. South Coast Bikeway. These are greenway corridors. Don't be afraid to push it through your city. Don't be afraid to say where it goes through the city, we want to get as safe a path as possible. Make it a greenway. Make it livable. <coughs> you, you, you know these maths. The, the myths, rail to trail, paths create trash. Go down the street. Let's talk about where there's trash. It attracts crime. Has anybody ever heard of eyes on the street, the whole community policing? The more you activate these rural areas or these paths, the less opportunity people have to do wrong. They reduce property values. That's the easiest one. There isn't, that I know of, one rail trail bike path where the property nearby doesn't go up in value. Real estate people start bragging, great house near the bike path. Right? Uh, da, 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 equipment study. They can't, people can't afford to keep it up. Now that's, that could be a real issue. But that's where you get community and, and citizen involvement. You know those signs, that this segment of road sponsored by the Boy Scouts, right? And every year the Boy Scouts come out and they do some cleaning. And that's a way to keep neighborhoods connected. In fact, if you really want to keep a neighborhood moving, get it organized to clean up some of its area. It's, it's one of the basic ways to do it. OK, beautiful, nature enhancing, sustainable. So here we are. Decatur Street in Atlanta. You ever been to Atlanta? Car city, right? I mean, talk about overdone. You think LA is bad? <laughs> Nothing on Atlanta. So this is a pretty boring, ugly street. Which street would you rather walk down? Okay, let, let's try that again. This is uh, 
Norte Avenue in Chico, California. Okay? Which one do you want? Let's try that again. Well, let me see if I have that down right. Is that better? Yeah? How about that? <laughs> so, incremental steps. Every one of the, none of these steps were phenomenally expensive by themselves. Paint for a bike lane, some trees, zebra crossing. Cumulatively, step by step, over time, you create a street that I'd love to live on. Inclusive, accessible. Oh, and the other thing about that picture, though, to me, that last little burst, you may not have caught it. It was the flowers. It was the trees in bloom. Mm -hmm. Nature's important. Beauty is important. You just feel happier and better, and you're nicer to other people when the flowers are blooming. You know, it could be at spring. You're so glad to get out. But, but I think it makes a difference. And I think greening space, streets, from that pavement to nature makes a huge difference. This is really the only picture I feel I all really need to show about accessibility. This is a. Uh, Beacon Hill. They don't lack for money up there. Right? This is my friend Chris Hart. <clears throat> I had to push him down those streets. We had to go in the street to get his wheelchair through. It's just unacceptable. Period. End of discussion. But it's not just him, really. It's people pushing their shop car, shopping carts. It's little kids. That's a walking school bus over there. What if you didn't have a walking school bus? Those kids wouldn't be walking. It shouldn't be that way. It should be safe. The, the carriages, and if you're on a bus, you should have a covered stop. No one should be waiting in the snow, in the wind, for a bus. This street, or this street? I'm like the optician, you know, this glass, this glass, right? <laughs> Which looks better? Which do you want to live in? Which do you think is more prosperous? Where do people come to shop? Here's another one. Yeah, I'm going to play a trick. Watch this. See this? That's the same street. You didn't think so. Watch. Let's see. Can I do this? That street? Same street. OK? What we've done, we've added nature, benches. We've made it a place. And we'll go through the steps. Here you go. Here we are. Back to the beginning. Ready? Storefronts, chairs. Got rid of some of the traffic markings, and into trees. And then you get people. Now, here's the amazing thing if you're a small business person is what's called an aesthetic bonus. People are willing to pay up to 10% more for the same product three blocks away if they're on this block with the trees. Why? Because you feel better. You're willing to be there, you want to be there. Okay, here's another one of my dreamscapes. You know, I, I'd love to be here. So back to where we started. If you don't know where you're going to go, it's hard to tell when you're heading in the wrong direction. And here's what we learned. If you plan for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. This is not rocket science. Right? This is real basic stuff. But unless we push this onto the traffic engineers, they're going to plan for cars and trucks. That's their job. That's what they were trained to do. That's what they're supposed to do. It's our job as citizens to say, what we want is people in places that contain cars, but that are set up for it. So here's a couple of key concepts. Good thing, because I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> Slow it down. Point number one. Two, give people alternatives. Bus, walk. Ride, plaza, give them sidewalk, give them plazas, give them places. It's not enough to just say, I'm going to give everybody a fair share. We've had 100 years of putting almost all of our investment into cars. We've got to actually prioritize bicycle, pedestrian, transit. It's a little bit like those intersections. Do you go down for the car to feel comfortable, or do you raise it? so that the people feel comfortable. Whose space is it? And I think we have to define our space by who's the most vulnerable. 
the most vulnerable get the most protection. Cars are not going to get hurt when they hit a pedestrian, unless you're Superman or something. But people will get hurt. Designed from the outside in, it's a fancy way of saying, start with the sidewalk. What do we need for a good sidewalk? Eight feet? Ten feet? Start there. Then, what do we need for a good bike facility? Six feet? Okay, what's left? How do we fit the cars in there? Now, we may have to go back and adjust some of the other stuff, but we start with the bikes and the pedestrians. Instead of, what do the cars need? What do we need for traffic lanes to get through this intersection? And well, where do we put the sidewalk? All where you start. You may end up at the same place, but the odds are you won't. And you'll still be able to serve the traffic needs while also serving others. Focus on safety. Everybody benefits when you do all these things. Don't go around saying, we're here to make this good for bikes. That's true. But you're really there to make it safer for everybody, for kids, for adults, for car drivers. That's the message. Treat your street as public space. This is our space. Talk about treating streets as public space. I started with a quote from Enrico Peñolosa. This is Bogota. Bogota, Colombia now shuts down every weekend a hundred miles of major thoroughfares. hundred miles and over a hundred thousand people and sometimes up to a million come out and ride and do Zumba and dance and hawk their wares and sell. This has become a celebration of the citizenry, of the city. This has become the embodiment of the life of that city. And if any city needed renovation, it was Bogota, Colombia. We all know the stories of what was going on there. This was the way the citizens reclaimed from people much more dangerous than some of our uh, obnoxious kids. But hey, why not here? So this is Hub on Wheels. This is Starro Drive. Can you imagine riding your bike down Starro Drive? It is so <laughs> much fun, let me tell you. It's like getting the candy your mother didn't want you to have. It's forbidden fruit. It's fabulous. Riding down Starro, going through the city. Now we only do it once a year, but I'm, we're working on it. We're going to get three. So if I was going to run for president, see, I would have a platform. And I'd say, I promise to improve everybody's health, lower our rates of asthma. I promise to make our kids better able to learn. I promise more jobs and lower taxes. Worried about dementia? I'm going to help you avoid dementia, heart attacks, cardiovascular, keep your medical bills down. Vote for me, a bicycle in every pot. Active transportation. I don't believe that there's one solution for all problems, but it turns out that actively moving solves a lot of problems. And we might as well use it because other things are more complicated and expensive to do. And while we're doing it, really, I beg you, have fun, have a parade, have a party. You know, streets are not just functional. If you're making them livable, the important thing about life is that you love it. That's why I started with happiness. You really, getting there should be at least half the fun. It's about our quality of life. Thank you. right in front of you, like yeah. you said, it'll force people to stop. But um, as far as Fall River being as unique a city as it is, and I'm just in love with the city, I'd like to see this happen. I'm just so excited about it. Um, we don't have lines on our streets, let alone zebras <laughs> or bumps yeah. or sidewalks that are flat. Because uh, I have a sister that has cerebral palsy, and she, uh, she has a difficult time in the city. She's fallen, I can't tell you how many times, yeah. just this season because of the snow. Mm -hmm. But the sidewalks, like you said, we need to start with, and then <coughs> whatever's left is for the, we'll make just enough for a road, for a car yeah. or travel, whatever. Um, I, I'd really like to see, uh, love to see this happen. I really would. I'm very excited about it. My and, father uh, always said that as you head towards the horizon, you should be careful to take small steps. I think the same thing is true here. You need to have a vision 
of how the city could be, how you'd like it to be. And then you need to pick ten projects, ten intersections, ten blocks, and work on them. And don't pretend you're going to get it all right the first time. Say, this is an experiment. We want to try. We're going to use paint, not thermoplastic, because paint wears off in two years anyway. Right? We're going to try this planters. We're not going to plant trees. We're going to put planters. If they don't work, we roll them someplace else. Pick a couple of priorities. So first, get your vision. Make sure you know what the whole picture is. And then pick a couple of things. People, myself included, and almost all public officials, of which I have been one, were a little nervous about change. I know how to manage barely with what I've got. You want to do it differently? I'm not sure I can pull it off. The public gets nervous. So what you want to do is assuage their, their worry. Give them a couple of physical realities to look at. And it turns out the earthquake doesn't happen. The sky doesn't open. You know, Satan doesn't arise. It's a bike lane. And it works. And no one got killed. So pick a couple. Five, ten. Pedestrian, bicycle. Okay? And work on those. We were talking earlier. You live in, I think it's District 5 of MassDOT. You should be really clear of what it is you want from their projects. You should quote all the new policies that the Secretary of Transportation has been issuing about the primacy and importance of healthy transportation, meaning bicycling, walking, and transit. And if they don't give you what you want, go to the Secretary. Get your state rep, Representative uh, Sanchez. Very stop. Know who your reps are. <laughs> Be clear what you want. Go ask for it nicely for MassDOT. If you don't get it, go over their heads and involve your elected officials. The mayor was here. Get him on your side. If he were to call the Secretary of Transportation, let me tell you the district will listen. Okay? So you need two, two levels. One is state, and the other is internal. Work with your DPW, work with your police. Pick a couple of spots, see if it works. But, yeah, go out and do it. You had one screenshot where you had the Sharrow going with the traffic. And on that street, there was a one-way, mm -hmm. and you had a bike lane going down. My only, lane. my only question is, any streets coming into that street, the uh, driver of the car would be looking only to the direction he knows where the traffic's coming from. Exactly true. So I was, why you I, would not do that on a very busy street with lots of So I would do that on a street that is relatively quieter, mm -hmm. or that there's no car, no roads coming in where I'm doing that kind of okay. contra lane. But bicyclists, because you're dealing with muscle power, not fossil fuels, it's work to get around. A bicyclist will probably do slightly stupid things to do to cut a mile off of a trip. Right? So you want to create a safe, efficient network for a bicyclist. To expect it, I'll give you an example. Uh, they're working on the Longfellow Bridge over the Charles River. They were going to shut down the bridge for various periods of time and force bicyclists to do a, basically a mile and a half detour. Now, if you're in a car, as my mother said, you're sitting on your rear end, it's not too much work to go an extra mile. But if you're on a bicycle, an extra mile, especially in the rain, is a long trip. So we basically fought them back and we said it's got to be open all the time, both directions, for bicyclists. You have to provide an efficient, almost direct route for bicycles if you want them to do it. But enough said on that. But you're right. You've got to be careful where you use the contra lanes. But they are totally safe when used properly. Yeah? Can you give us an overview of the active streets legislation and how that might help a community like Fall River? Yeah. So, new uh, piece. Let me backtrack. The, the Patrick administration has been trying to muscle up the energy and the political force to do major investments in transportation. <clears throat> they came up with something called the Way Forward uh, about nine months ago. It was this vision, including the, uh, the new rail uh, line down this area, lots of uh, 
$400 billion for off-road bicycle pedestrian facilities, a whole lot of stuff. It didn't go very far. But what it did do is sparked the legislature to pass a bond bill, which is now in the Senate. It's passed the House. It's now been through the Senate committees. So it's on the floor of the Senate, and then they'll reconcile the differences. The bond bill has less money and slightly different projects than was described in the way forward. But even if the bond bill passes, what then matters is something called and I'll come back to the bond bill because that's where the active transportation piece is right now. What's then necessary is that the bond bill authorizes the state to borrow money for various purposes. The state does not have to bond, take that money. So the next step is what's called a capital investment or capital improvement plan, CIP. The CIP, it's a five-year plan. It was just issued. And they say they'll update it in another five months. But the current plan is what the administration anticipates using out of the bond bill over the next five years. Okay, you have those, those steps? So the real bottom line is what gets included in the CIP, and then just to make it even more difficult, the, it, the, this administration and the next administration <coughs> has to then ask for the money to invest in the things that are listed in the capital investment plan. Okay, so administration proposal, legislative bond bill, administration capital plan, and then administration action. Okay. So back to the bond bill. Included in the bond bill is a provision called active streets. It provides $50 million over five years for, as an incentive for communities to go a little bit beyond the norm. You have to adopt street, uh, complete streets programs. You have to do a certain amount of encouragement of walking and bicycling. There's a set of requirements. They're pretty loose. So what's going to be important is how those, the, the rules for those are eventually interpreted. But right now, that is part of the bond bill. It is not yet included because it's not a capital <coughs> investment. It's not included in the capital investment plan because it's, in itself it's not capital, it's an incentive piece of money. Okay? But because it hasn't been passed by the legislature officially, it hasn't been activated by the administration either. So not to throw cold water on it, but we've got several steps we have to push it through. Should it get passed, <coughs> then it provides extra money if a city puts in a little bit of extra effort. So when, when they finally do pass it, our next job is to push the administration to set up application rules and criteria, and then to apply for it. Uh, do we have a tourist person here yet? I don't think we have a person that would possibly be the advocate for us. I mean, I don't know what that would be, a director of transportation or a director of tourism or something we like that. We have a bicycle commission. I'm sure you have yeah. an economic development group. Do we have anybody running that? Do we have somebody? I, I, don't, I don't think the city has somebody like you're referring as far as, I think that's what the city needs. I, I want to say we have a budget for a position like that. I just recently heard. Anybody confirm that? I, I'd like to know. So okay. how, how are we going to have this, um, I, for what you just said, made complete sense. How, how do we get that <laughs> if we don't have somebody advocating for us? The active transportation money or the, um, the transformation of your city? You are the change agent in the city. Okay. The advantage of being in a relatively small city, I mean, I was just watching the interaction between the mayor and, and you all, between some of the city staff. It's a friendly place. People know each other. It gives you the ability, if you had this many people working together on an active basis, you could get half a dozen of these projects up in a year. Where do I sign? Where do you sign? <laughs> Talk to Julie. I think, see, you can frame this as economic development, you can frame it as public health, you can frame it as transportation. Personally, I think it's most powerful if you say safety. Safety, and then some health. Who's going to argue with health and safety, right? And then it's about economic development. Oh, and by the way, it's about walking and bicycling. If the money's there, we need to submit something together. I think I mean, there's I think so much that can be done without extra money. 
You should never allow the lack of money to hinder you because every year the DPW restripes some number of roads. Every year those roads can be restriped in a way that facilitates this. Every year you fill potholes and redo some of the streets. Why not use that opportunity street by street? It's what I call principled opportunism. Right? Take advantage of your opportunities to move your principles. So that's what you have available to you. No extra money. It doesn't take all that much money to put out planters. It takes thinking about how you want that intersection to look and then finding cheap ways to do it as an experiment. Remember we said, it doesn't work while you've put in its planters and paint. You can do it right now. I mean, oh, money helps. I mean, you know, I, I play the lottery. Right? It helps. I never win. But it, it's not necessary. The main road at Fall River, I want to say it's one of the main roads. Yeah. Avenue, William S. Canning Boulevard. It's 17 different names in about a two-mile stretch. <laughs> and uh, we have such a wasted median in the middle of this road, mm -hmm. in both directions. I mean, what could we do with that? Think about that. It's, it's amazing. It's just waiting to be done. Yeah. I mean... Well, we were talking earlier okay. that Plymouth Avenue mm -hmm. is going to have real bike lanes um, in, within the next year when they finish the project. And I believe they're putting street trees in the... Is that right, Jane? You know? Street trees along that median and uh, doing improvements to the sidewalks. So the Plymouth Avenue part of that 17 different named street is, is a beginning. We just said, we talked actually today about the William Canning Boulevard part of it. So um, there's some activity that needs to be done to advocate for that, but it's begun. <laughs> the most important thing is to remember you have much more power than you think you do. What you need is the imagination to think about what it is you want and the assertiveness to push for it. But this room could make a difference. Seriously. And your sister will benefit. She's trying to get a bus seven days a week here in the city. I don't know how soon. We've got one seven days a week. What was that, sir? Demand response. Demand response? Demand response. That's sort of. Salsa. It's also part of sort of. That's part of sort of. I believe that one seven days a week. I'm not sure. I look forward to that, sir, around seven days a week. You want to get on the bus? They do. They spots. Okay. So, I think what I want to add to what Steve has said is that in a group like this, you have to end with action. Absolutely. And, um, and boy, there's been a lot spoken about tonight that demands action. And I, I want to start, though, by uh, speaking a moment about someone who could not be here. And, and because it's very related, because Steve said, do drawings, have a vision. Well, Al Lima, back in 2010, when we were writing the latest um, open space and recreation plan, did these amazing drawings of, the quick, of what could be the Quickishan River Rail Trail. And now it's happening. I mean, that groundbreaking is going to take place this spring for the Quickishan Rail Trail, and it will be completed in 2015. So that's like tomorrow. Wow. And he's, he did other uh, pictures also, which will be hanging in the um, staircase, ga staircase gallery in the next show. Uh, one is of the Mount Hope Bay Greenway, and that's, that's a vision that needs some work on it. Um, Al has suffered a stroke and is in a uh, hospital right now, but um, I just wanted to also speak to his, uh, we call it the triangle, Al, I call it Al's triangle, and it's you need a vision, you need to see an opportunity, and then you need advocacy. And we have seen some of that with Plymouth Avenue, for example. We've seen that work where a few, even a few voices saying, wait a minute, I thought there were supposed to be bike lanes. And people um, from DOT have turned back and said, I guess they want bike lanes. And we've got them coming on, um, on Plymouth Avenue. So remember that. Um, but as far as getting active, I want to just mention what you may have seen when you walked in, and if you didn't, 
please sign the register up there. Uh, regarding walking, um, we are, and I point out Marsha Picard in the back, who the school wellness policy person. Can you wave, Marsha? Uh, she and I and um, uh, the schools, and uh, I want to mention Rebecca Kusick here, who runs the uh, teachers' union, uh, that we're working together to increase student uh, reduce student absenteeism at school, to get kids to school ready to learn, and a walking school bus is one way to make that happen. It's happening in other cities and in cities with situations similar or even worse than Fall Rivers in terms of safety concerns, real or not, but uh, such as Springfield. So there's a form up there or a, a flyer up there about the walking school bus we're planning with the Watson School, with Vivera School, with Green School, Laterno. So if anyone is connected to any of those schools, has a grandchild, has a business, lives around those schools, please be in touch with us to participate, if you have the time and inclination, in the walking school bus. That's one. We got a small grant to look at the senior centers on, at Flint and Niagara on Healthy aging is, is, is helped by active living. So to look at those senior centers and what prevents people from being able to walk to the senior centers, say from the high rise at Cottrell, or uh, crossing the street to get a cup of coffee or whatever, to, to get down to Father Travasso Park. We're going to be looking at that over the next few months. So there's a sign-up sheet for that. And I would love your participation in that. Um, thirdly, we are working on Bike Safety Day, which is going to be May, May 18th. And that's focused on family safety uh, around <coughs> bicycle use. But we're going to have a training um, for adults who would like to teach children about bike safety. And that could be a grandparent, a parent. But it also could be a school teacher, a phys ed teacher, anyone on the bike committee. Um, we're going to be doing that on March 21st and at the police department with police officers and people from the Boys and Girls Club. So we have a room for about 10, 5 to 10 more participants. So let me know, please, if you're interested. Uh, there's information, a brochure about the Bicycle Committee, Fall River Bicycle Committee, in the back there. With uh, We meet every month. We'll be meeting Monday, right, Brian? Well, as long as the weather holds up. <laughs> 6, 6.30? Uh, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock here in the cafeteria every month, but get on the mailing list or the email list by calling Brian. And finally, and I think finally, and very importantly, is the fourth annual South Coast Bikeway Alliance Summit is on March 27th. It's being held this year in New Bedford. Um, the keynote speaker is going to be Willie Weir, who's an adventure cyclist and has cycled, I don't know, thousands, thousands of miles. Uh, and, but also the mayors, both mayors will be represented. Uh, Representative Bill Strauss, uh, Eric Weiss from the East Coast Greenway. They will all be there because this is a united effort to get the South Coast bikeway uh, in place. And, uh, you know, and that is our big vision is from Providence to Provincetown. And we're responsible, though, from Swansea to Wareham. That's the south coast. And so we're looking at that bike path, uh, which will also, of course, much of it will be for walkers. All of the off-road, such as the Quickershan River Rail Trail, will be off-road and will be for kids and will be for walkers and wheelchairs whatever, it'll just be healthy living. So um, please think about coming to this on March 27th. Uh, um, it's, it's a great event, and like I said, it's the fourth annual. So we have been having these summits jointly among all these communities uh, for four years now, starting with our first uh, meet in the middle bike ride from uh, with a contingent from New Bedford and a contingent from Fall River and meeting in Dartmouth in the middle and saying, wow, this is a good idea, what do we do next? And so 
we're on to the um, creating this bike way, and, and the time is right. And this South Coast uh, Bikeway Alliance has been working on the bond bill, has been doing incredible advocacy. Brian is the person to get in touch with to, you know, get you on top of that and who to call and call your legislators because we need the bond bill, but we need the CIP to make sure that it's including our region where so much money has gone into the Cape and has gone to, out into western Massachusetts. We need it down here in the south coast and we need it now. So I hope to see everybody involved in some way. And thank you so much for coming out thank tonight. You. And thank you, Steve, for a great. Thank you so much.